Hi, my name is Louisa Nicola. I'm a neurophysiologist and human performance coach. I'm the founder of Neural Athletics, where our mission is to democratize brain health education so you can perform better, think faster, and live longer. Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. Louisa, thank you so much for joining us back on the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. You and I have just been having a little chat in between internet um, stuff ups around how our very first episode was in 2018. Uh, you came on the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast podcast back then. And to be honest, I remember that episode we did was kind of like the first introduction to a lot of your work in general, mm -hmm. like just from the whole um, neuroscience and neurophysiology space that really got me intrigued and I feel like that was the catalyst for me really doing a deep dive on that topic and continuing to explore that myself and educating myself as much as possible and I've also just mentioned how it's been incredible to watch your growth in the industry and the value you're having on your audience and, and the wider community um, through your content and through new athletics as well um, which has been incredible to see so how has that growth felt like for you from your perspective since 2018 until now? Give us a bit of a rundown on, on that journey to where we are today. Yeah. And I just want to say that like, this is like, this is amazing that we're meeting again. Like my God, 2018, I had just, I moved to the U S in, I think around 2016, 2017. And I actually remember, I think I recorded in a hotel room somewhere because that's how my journey started in the U S and it was, it was so hard to get started uh, in this country. It's, mm. I, I live in New York City now and it's a very, very tough market. So, I mean, look, I look at my growth and think it's not as fast as what I would like. I think, you know, so many, so many hours, thousands upon thousands of hours have gone into, you know, I think now on Instagram and I'm at about 250,000, but I have a very well-performing podcast just like you and the amount of networking mm. that has gone into that. I think to myself, oh my God, how come I don't have a million people on there? So it's, um, <laughs> look, slow yeah. and steady wins the race, but it's been absolutely incredible. I think the number one thing is like I've I've grown so much professionally and academically. I have my first paper it's in the peer-reviewed pro uh, process right now coming out okay. um and it's just you know it's just unbelievable i'd love for you to speak on that quickly before we get into i guess the meat of today's episode which i'm really excited about just the point you made around your improvement or your growth academically because i think when people look at someone like yourself and and maybe even with my podcast and people in the whatever industry it's in, right? We see social media, we see the growth of the audiences and everything like that. And, and it becomes very easy to get attracted to just becoming a very good marketer and becoming very oh. good at making content, but just losing sight of what your actual fucking job is and what mm. you're here to do. And so how do you find that balance between putting in the time, effort and, and work to improve your knowledge and your skill sets and, and the academic side of things while at the same time putting out a lot of valuable content and growing your audience as well. It is not easy. And I have to tell you, like I have been on, like I've been on some of the biggest podcasts globally and people ask me like, Oh, how did you know all mm. that stuff? I was like, I'm like, well, a, I, I've done, <laughs> I've done three <laughs> advanced degrees, but on the daily, on a daily basis, I'm reading and reading. I now actually have an analyst um, on my team. I have staff members now. Um, so I have a 10 person team. Crazy. So I'm constantly reviewing and reading and upgrading myself. I'm like I said to you, I've, um, I've got a paper coming out, a systematic review. It took me six months to write Danny, six months. There's over 1500 references in there. So everything <laughs> I talk about when I'm on these podcasts is not just because I read a book and that's what I actually want everybody to understand, especially when it comes to social media. There are people who can literally just maybe read a passage and then regurgitate it on a screen. But if you were to ask them, what are the mm. biochemical pathways and the precursors to everything that you just said, they probably wouldn't even understand how to give you that answer. Whereas if I'm saying something, yeah. I know why I've done, you know, thousands of hours of research on every reel that goes out. I've had quite a few viral reels. I mean, like that have hit like 
10 million yeah. views. And I think, and in each and every one of them, even if they're about 30 seconds long, there is about five years of reading that goes behind <laughs> that reel. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible, isn't it? I think to your point you said before as well, it's it can be frustrating at times, isn't it, when you know how much time, effort, work, consistency has gone into it. And as you said before, it's like, why is my audience not over a million when I'm adding so much value? Do you get frustrated sometimes when you put out a piece of content that you know how valuable it is and it doesn't hit? It doesn't go, oh, doesn't go viral. Story of yeah, my it's life. Frustrating. And you know what's <laughs> funny? The thing, so I put up a mixture of reels and quotes, right? Yeah. And just things that I'm thinking from like an, um, from a Twitter standpoint, I just put that up. They come, I put those up within like, I think about it and then I put them up. They're never planned for me. They're the ones that mm. go viral. They're the ones yeah. that get like 5,000 forwards and like, I'll get maybe a thousand new followers. But along with that, I'll also get a thousand people unfollowing me. And mm. actually something um, yesterday I put up, there was a recent review that was brought up at Grand Rounds. So Grand Rounds um, here in uh, in New York, they happen once a week and it's where the heads of departments from neurology, cardiology, they all get together once a week and somebody presents on the latest findings. And I'm part of the NYU one. So you'll get the head of neurosurgery at Mount Sinai. People fly in all over the world for Grand Rounds. At Grand Rounds about six or seven months ago, somebody presented in terms of the infectious disease department, somebody introduced this new article that came out saying that cats, stray cats, okay, hold a, um, hold a parasite. And it's, this parasite has killed 40 million people in the US. So it was brought up in Grand Rounds. So I just remembered it the other day. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. So I put that up and it just got <laughs> like, I think I got like a thousand full, uh, a thousand um, follows and then like 800 unfollows. People were DMing me, telling me I hate cats. I'm like, <laughs> cat lovers weren't what? happy. <laughs> oh, the cat lovers weren't happy. And I'm like, I've, I've put the, I've put the PMID in, in there. And it was, it's just an intro. It's also really, I love doing this. Like I love science communication. Incredible. Well, I want to make sure we make the most of our time today and, and get as much value as we can for the audience. Cause you have so much value to offer. There's a number of different uh, paths I want to take in today's um, conversation. But the first one I wanted to discuss with you is around Alzheimer's because I know you do so much work in that on that topic and your your value and your knowledge in that area is is so high. I personally don't even know where to start when it comes to even what questions to ask and what I should be asking. But yeah. are we able to spend a little time talking about Alzheimer's and your work in that area? Yeah. Um, if that's yeah. okay. Absolutely. So this is my area of research. Um, I'm, that's what the review article is coming out about. I'm also part of a team that awesome. is developing World Alzheimer's Day. So stay tuned for that. Incredible. Alzheimer's disease, it's a neurodegenerative disease and it sits under the umbrella of dementia. So you've probably heard mm. of dementia. Dementia is just a set of diseases or symptoms. Underneath the umbrella, dementia, sits Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer's disease. You've got frontotemporal mm -hmm. dementia. You've got dementia with Lewy bodies. You've got Parkinson's dementia. And the most prominent one, the one that most people are affected by is Alzheimer's disease, which is why everybody has heard of it. And mm. Alzheimer's disease is a loss of your cognitive functions. And the debilitating thing about this disease is it is the only disease, you know, you look at cardiovascular disease, the leading cause of death, you look at cancer, you look at all of these diseases, none of them has the ability for you to forget who you are. People in the end mm. stages of the disease, or even in the, you know, maybe their last five years, they forget who they are and who you are is the most important thing in this world. That's what we, we are all in search of who we are. And then to have our, ourselves just have a disease strip that away from us is so devastating. And we, have, we don't have a cure for it. But I'll give you a brief rundown on, on what we've, as a society, what we know about it so far. Mm -hmm. Currently, 55 million people worldwide have Alzheimer's disease. That number is said to triple by the year 2050. Now, you look at these, you know, 55 million people have it. It's you, you know, there is 30 genes involved. It's both a, you've got a, a genetic component 
but then you've also got a lifestyle component that leads to it. In terms of genetic, we'll just get that out of the way. There are around 30 genes involved in Alzheimer's disease, but there's only really three genes that predict that if you get these three genes, you will get dementia. It, there is no ifs or buts, but the rest of the genes, they're just lifestyle genes. They're just risk factor genes. They're like a, they're like a light switch. You, even if you've mm. got them, it doesn't mean you'll get the disease. So the three genes, yeah. which means that 100% penetrant, you will get the disease is amyloid precursor protein. And then you've got presenelin one and presenelin two. We don't need to go into those. But then you've got these other genes that a lot of people hear about. They're risk genes. For example, there's one called the APOE4. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you can get Haven't. tested for it. Okay. So apolipoprotein E is, we've all got these genes. We've got apolipoprotein E1, E2, E3, E4. We, we all get them, right? We get one from okay. mama, one from dad. Now, we don't get all of them. That depends on your parents. So for example, you may get APOE2 and APOE4 or APOE3 and APOE2. Okay. You'll get a mixture, but either way you'll get one. And it turns out that if you get the APOE4 gene, if you get one of them, again, given from mom or dad, you raise your risk of Alzheimer's disease by four times. If you get two copies of this gene, your risk is increased by 12 times. So it turns out that these two genes, which affects a you know a, a under 10% of the population, but it's still a, a large majority. If you get these mm. genes, maybe you'll get Alzheimer's disease, but it turns out that only 50%, even if you've got two copies of this gene, genes, only 50% of the people will get the disease. So that begs the question then, Danny, like y your next question should be, well, Louisa, if these are only risk genes and only 50% of people get them, then why are so many people getting Alzheimer's disease? Like why do we have 50 million people getting the disease? And the answer mm. lies in lifestyle. Yeah. It turns out that the way that we live our life through what we eat, how we exercise, or even if we decide to exercise, how we sleep, the people that you talk to, the negative thoughts that you have, yeah. the stress factors, the environment you live in, these all add up to you either getting the disease or not getting the disease. And guess what? It turns out that out of that 50 million people that I mentioned, 55 million people worldwide that have the disease, only three to 5% of that 50 million have the genetic risk factors of Alzheimer's disease. So the rest, the 95% of the, that population don't even have the genes responsible for Alzheimer's disease. So they're just getting it mm. due to lifestyle factors. That's crazy. And that was one of the questions I wanted to ask around this is how much, and you've kind of obviously just answered this, but how much of an impact, even just from a, a, what we're filling our brains with daily, the thoughts we're having, the repeated actions, the environment we're spending time in, all of that side of things is so impactful in, in so many areas outside of even outside of Alzheimer's, but that is insane. And so from all those environmental factors and those lifestyle choices, what are some of the ones that you're seeing many people make on a daily basis that you see and you go, Hey, we should make some changes here. If you want to reduce your risk of, of developing Alzheimer's disease. So I'm a bit biased, but you know, there's very good reason. My area of research yeah. is exercise on mild mm. cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment is a pre-dementia state. So what a lot of people don't think is that people just think, oh, Alzheimer's disease is involved in, you know, in old age and you're just going to get it when you're 65 or 70. That's not the case. Mm. You are diagnosed with this disease, like many neurodegenerative diseases, like Parkinson's as well. You get these diseases in the late stages of your life. However, they started in your 30s. And they start in your 30s because a lot of the time, this is when things start to break down. At the age of 30, our brain begins to atrophy. Our central nervous system, which yep. is your brain and spinal cord, it, it, we start to get loss of neurons. They are brain cells. We have around 87 to 100 billion nerve cells, neurons in the human yep. brain, and they begin to die off. When they die off, we have less capacity to do things. So we move into these cognitive impairment states, which is 
memory loss, information processing speed, uh, reaction time, they all start to diminish as we get older throughout our 30s, 40s, 50s. And then at 70, it's like, okay, you've got Alzheimer's disease and you cannot reverse it. You cannot cure it. So a question yeah. just quickly, sorry to interrupt you. A question around that is I'm assuming as we lose these neurons, like that reduces our ability or the effectiveness of neuroplasticity that, that I'm assuming that's a, a no brainer there, right? Well, yes and no. Um, neuroplasticity isn't too much about how many neurons you have. It's the ability okay. for the existing neurons to change right. and adapt to whatever commands that you give it. Yeah. And so one last question before I let you keep going, sorry to really interrupt, but around that age, so let's say we've got someone in their mid thirties and their lifestyle choices are, are leading to this, you know, degeneration of, uh, or these loss of neurons, like, is that reversible before they reach the stage of Alzheimer's? Unfortunately, what you're referring to is the creation of new neurons, neurogenesis. New and neurons, this yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. So neurogenesis doesn't exist in adult brains. It exists only in one area. And we're going to get into that. It exists in the area yep. called the hippocampus. So mm -hmm. what are some ways that we can, what the, the better question is, how can we slow the progression of this age related loss? Because you and I, as we get older, if you look at an MRI, right, you've got your skull between your skull, you've got this interstitial fluid, and then you've got your brain. And it's a very, very, it's like yep. very thin paper thin, um, between the skull and the brain. If you and I did an MRI, yep. if we do an MRI on a completely healthy individual, that is, you know, 70 or 80. And even though they don't have Alzheimer's disease, that space is much bigger because you just naturally, your brain just naturally atrophies. So instead of saying, how can we stop it? Because that's never going to happen. The question is, how can we slow the progression of it? So if we line up all these 80 year old brains, who can have the thickest brain? And this is where we get into exercise and this is where we answer your question before, like what are some of the interventions that you can be doing in your 20s and 30s? And it lies in sleep mm. and exercise. I'll go into exercise first. We now have tons of data. I'm talking human randomized control trials. These are scientific studies that are done on humans to show that we can slow the brain aging process through exercise alone. So what type of exercise? Well, let's first talk about aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise, mm -hmm. such as long runs, walks, whatever. The biggest thing, so the best thing that you can- that's in that, that, that aerobic exercise, are we talking about, uh, let's like zone two, like to the point where it's not- Correct. Let's talk about zone two. Yeah. Anything that you can yeah. sustain for a long period of time, let's say an hour. So yep. when you're engaging in these activities, you're doing many things. One thing that you're doing for the brain is you get the release of growth factors. And these growth factors, the biggest one and the most widely studied one is BDNF. It stands for brain-derived mm -hmm. neurotropic factor. When this is released, it has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. And we have these, you know, these little cells and, and they, they're bound together by tight junctions on the outside of our brain that don't allow for the, the passage of molecules to come in and out of it. And that's good because we don't want everything to pass through our brain. But BDNF yeah. passes through that. And what happens is it goes to a specific area in the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is this seahorse shaped structure and it lives in the temporal lobes. Your temporal lobes are behind your ears. It leave, lives deep in the temporal lobes. And when it goes in there, it helps with the growth and proliferation of neurons. So you grow new neurons in the hippocampus. And Danny, the hippocampus is responsible for memory formation. It's responsible for mm -hmm. consolidation of memories and responsible for learning. It's the first thing to wow. go in mild cognitive impairment. So the first thing to go in the first signs of Alzheimer's disease, it's your short-term memory. It's when you start saying in your forties, right? And I don't want anybody to get scared, but it's when you start thinking, what's that guy's name? Where are my keys? Oh, what school, what was my school? What school did I attend? Or what was my dog's first name? It's like, 
think like short, well, my dog's first name, maybe that will be a long-term memory, but short-term memory starts to go. So yeah. evidently, we now have evidence that exercise is good for the aging brain. Aerobic exercise mm. specifically, not just the growth factors, you're also pumping blood to your brain. Your brain loves blood. It is the most vascular rich organ in the entire body. And what happens is we've got this, we've got branching out of the aorta. So our, our aorta branches out into the carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries. And then you've got branching out from there into the brain. And if we are constantly getting blood to our brain through physical activity, we're getting oxygen and we're getting nutrients. If your brain doesn't, if an area in your brain doesn't get adequate blood flow, what happens? The cells die, the cells atrophy. Mm. So therefore, long bouts of physical activity are extremely, extremely crucial for your brain. Incredible. On that topic, um, and I hope you don't mind if I ask this kind of while we mentioned the exercise side of things, I know pre, I've heard you talk a number of times about certain supplements that you find extremely beneficial for brain health, one of them being creatine monohydrate, the second one being around fish oils, but more specifically around the um, EPA and DHA. Um, those, those two are out of the fish oils. Are you able to spend a couple of minutes talking on, on I guess, the benefit the cognitive benefit of creatine monohydrate firstly, because I think that often just gets paired with the physical benefits, um, but yeah. also some detail around the fish oils as well, the omega-3s. I will. I was, that was going to be my third pillar because I didn't finish exercise oh, yet, but I will apology. let me, my yeah, I, we didn't even get into <laughs> resistance training, but I'm going to, I, I actually won't talk. I will talk about creatine, but just let me finish with the benefits of resistance training because this is where <laughs> yeah, sure. the most beautiful parts of um, of exercise interventions comes in. So resistance mm -hmm. training has a whole other host of benefits than what um, aerobic training does. It turns out that when we resistance train, we release so many more beneficial growth factors for the brain. And we now are showing, and this is what my review article is about, we're now showing that we can slow and even possibly reverse some of the damages that have taken place for dementia patients with, with um, exercise interventions of resistance training. So what happens is wow. when you are weight training, right, what we do is when you contract your muscle, we release these myokines. Myokines are muscle-based proteins. They're these little proteins that only live in the muscle fibers. They don't live anywhere else. They live in the cells of the muscle. And when you squeeze that muscle, a contraction, you release these. They go into the bloodstream, they go up into the brain, and we have receptors. We actually have receptors, Danny, on all over our bodies. We've got receptors on our organs, like our heart, our spleen, our liver, our, your prostate, and they're now showing that these myokines can actually have an effect not just on dementia but also on cancer. There's a really amazing study that was printed in a high stringent journal. It was actually printed in Cell Press, and it showed that myokines can actually mitigate the effects of prostate cancer. So they're now showing that myokines through wow. resistance training, that's the only place that, that they can be um, released, through resistance training yeah. can help like stave off cancers, especially so there's prostate cancer and breast cancer. So like wow. resistance training, yeah, I mean, as a caveat, you have to be lifting heavy. You have to be lifting at around 80% of your one repetition max to get the benefits. Okay. But I got to tell you, yep. like, it is exercise as a whole is an elixir for all cause mortality and for longevity. That's incredible. I, I'd never really heard that around. Obviously, I, I understand the, the large number of benefits of strength and resistance training. But when you say it has to be around that, let's say 80% of the, your one RM um, to, mm. to find that benefit, how much of your training needs to be in that range? Is that just a, let's say one or two movements in your strength training program? Or is that the benefits of that is only happening when you're lifting in that range, if that makes sense? So you're, so in terms of like programming around it, what you want to do is you really want mm. to stick for longevity benefits. You want to be doing around three hours of zone two training per week. 
And this comes from Inigo San Malal, who San Milan, who actually coined the term zone two. So he proposes for longevity benefits that we want to be sticking to three hours at minimum per week. But then in terms of strength training, you do want to be lifting. All of the studies that have been shown on this shows that lifting uh, three to four times a week at that 80%, one repetition max per muscle group is what's needed. Incredible. And with the zone two training, are you regularly basing that off a a heart rate range? Is that how you're prescribing the zone two? So at NeuroAthletics, like we have, um, you know, we're, we consult and we train um, high profile, high net worth individuals, and we're mm-hmm. using lactate to determine this. And we're trying to keep it under two millimoles. Okay. And for the yeah. average listener who doesn't have access to that type of thing, uh, are we going yeah. just basing it off being the ability to be exercising at a level where you're still able to hold a conversation or would you recommend sticking with a certain yeah. heart rate range for, for that type of individual? I would recommend everybody understanding what their maximum heart rate is and then getting Mm -hmm. 65% of that. And I don't recommend the the numbers game. You don't need to go and play 220 minus your age. You can actually do the, yeah, you can do a, um, an 11 minute step protocol. Like you can run as fast as you can. There's so many, there's a Norwegian protocol that you can be doing to actually figure out what your VO2 max is. You don't need fancy equipment, but Everybody mm-hmm. should understand what their VO2 max is. It doesn't matter how old you are. And once you do your VO2 max, you're able to then differentiate and figure out what's your zone two from that, what's your zone three, zone four, what's your maximum heart rate. And then you can work out 65 to 70% of that would be your zone two. Incredible. And for yeah. those that are listening or watching at the moment that don't have an understanding of what the VO2 max is, actually is yeah. are you able to go into a quick little bit of detail around that for us please yeah so that is your representation of your cardiorespiratory fitness so it's a measure of how fit you are really and mm-hmm. it's measured in um so it's basically how well can you utilize oxygen when you are going really really hard and if you were to go and do this in a lab which you can actually get this almost anywhere you can get this done anywhere you would really, you would hook up a, a mask and it's actually a really, it's not a very nice test, but you would mm. definitely get a definitive test to see how fit you are. And it places you against age and gender. It places you saying that you are below average, you are, uh, you are fit, you are intermediate, or you are an elite. And from that, you can then figure out your rate of all cause mortality, really what we have now, we have studies that show and link longevity outcomes, example, all cause mortality to VO2 max scores, because it turns out that we actually need a high amount of fitness as we're getting older. So you need to, for example, you need a VO2 max of, which is very, very low, but you need a VO2 max of at least 12 to get up out of bed and go to the bathroom and sit down on a toilet and get back up. So that's pretty interesting, yeah. really. So you think about this as you're getting older and it's a great measure. So I think everybody should be yeah. doing that. Yeah, 100%. Back to the the lifestyle choices or the, the factors that are, again, uh, putting at risk of, of developing Alzheimer's. You mentioned sleep. Obviously, sleep is an extremely important um, not yeah. only recovery factor, but obviously in cases like this, extremely important too. We've been really fortunate to have a number of, um, I guess, sleep specialists on the show. We had uh, Dr. Dean Miller on recently, who was who gave some really good, incredible insight as well. But I'm interested to hear or, or to hear from you the importance of REM sleep and deep sleep and how people kind of get this confused, particularly around just spending time in bed or spending time asleep, thinking that that is all that's needed and the impact a lack of REM or deep sleep can actually have not only on, again, develop, uh, factors developing uh, Alzheimer's, but even just from a day-to-day cognitive and physical function perspective as well. Mm. Yeah. So there's actually so much research that's just coming out now to show that what's even more important than sleep depth or even sleep time yep. is sleep consistency. So before you do absolutely anything, before we okay. even look at the whole REM mm. sleep and deep sleep, we have to understand that sleep consistency is actually what's going to be better for your brain 
as we move further throughout our years. Consistency meaning your brain wants you to go to bed at the same time every day and wake up at the same time every day. I understand we're not robots, but that's what the science says. So sleep consistency. Then we have to have a look first and foremost at total sleep time. How much are you sleeping? Because that's going to determine whether you're actually getting into deep sleep and REM sleep for long enough. So REM sleep, Mm. as we know, is, well, let's actually talk about deep sleep. So deep sleep is stage three sleep, also known as slow wave sleep, as we see on a polysomnography, your polysomnography, you will see these big delta waves. Okay. And that's what happens when you're in deep sleep. So deep sleep is when you are completely paralyzed, brain, body paralyzed. And what happens is you activate this system in your brain called the glymphatic system. And it primarily takes place during deep sleep. And what happens is you're, you've got these little cells, they're called glial cells. And these glial cells are like glue and they stick between the neurons. And during deep sleep, when you're very, very fast asleep, they shrink in size. And when Mm. they shrink, it allows for the cerebral spinal fluid in your brain to wash everything. It washes the debris, right? We get toxins build up throughout the day. We get from the food we eat to the environment, to the air that we're breathing. We have all these toxic molecules that go into our bodies and accumulates in the cerebral spinal fluid of our brain. Now, what happens mm. is when you're in deep sleep the, and, you're in the, and you activate that system, it pulls them out like a washing machine, right? So it clears it wow. out. One of the molecules that it clears out is amyloid beta. Now, that is a protein that over time, if you don't clean your brain, it aggregates. It, it sticks to each other. It becomes sticky like clumps. And that right. is what ends up that we the 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 what the theory around alzheimer's disease is it is the amyloid hypothesis amyloid cascade hypothesis that's what we know so far about alzheimer's disease that this amyloid beta protein it builds up it clumps together and it stops us from it stops the neurons from working and it stops the brain from working basically forms these holes or or, or these plaques yeah. in the in the walls of the of the brain so you have to understand that if you're not sleeping you are inhibiting your ability to clean those proteins out and what happens just like in a bank compound interest builds up if you don't sleep for one night yeah. Danny, that's it's not going to do anything. But let's just say you're going to go 20 years of sleep deprivation, and we're seeing this in night shift workers. We're seeing this in with doctors, with nurses. Eventually, over the course of 20 years, those mm. those little molecules will build up. So deep sleep is extremely important for your brain. Not just that, deep sleep also is involved in the release of hormones. You've got testosterone. 95% of a male's total testosterone is released during deep sleep. Yeah. We've seen seen a a really great study shown that if you sleep deprive men, healthy men in their 40s, if you sleep deprive them to five hours and 48 minutes, I remember the study clearly, five hours and 48 minutes, their serum testosterone levels, which is measured first thing in the morning, drops by around 58%. That's a big, like, you know, so there's so many men walking around. We actually have a a testosterone deficiency epidemic. I'm here in the US. We do have one here. So many men in their 30s are reporting Mm. to have serum testosterone levels that of a 70 year old. And it's got to do with a lot of things, but the first thing it has to do with is sleep. So we also get the release of growth hormone during deep sleep as well, which is involved in the repair of our muscles and everything else. So deep sleep, incredibly important. Okay, awesome. And so deep sleep being incredibly important, correct me if I'm wrong, but REM sleep is responsible for um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? It's responsible for allowing us to integrate things we've learned, right? And and to process memories and stuff like that with the hippocampus. So when we look at deep sleep and REM sleep, I know it's a bit difficult, but is there a guide around how much in terms of percentage we, we should be aiming to have of deep sleep in comparison to REM sleep? Total sleep time should be made up of 20% REM sleep. And you kind of want a one to two ratio. So you want to be doubling the amount of deep sleep to REM sleep. Yeah. And what have you found to be the best 
uh, measurable tool for that. Like I've been wearing a whoop for like the last few years. I actually haven't tried an aura ring, but is there a recommendation um, from your side as to what seems to be the most accurate in terms of recording the quality of sleep? Honestly, the aura and the the whoop strap, I would say they're just they're they're the same. You're never going to get anything outside of a hospital that is going to be 100% accurate. Yeah. So you want to take it with a grain of salt. But what you want to really rely on with these wearables is trends. So if you're if be, you've been wearing the whoop for quite a yep. number of years, it knows you. So if one day it says that maybe your REM sleep is five percent, then okay, then maybe you know that something's going on. So I wouldn't rely on it for reliability and accuracy. I would just rely on your wearables more so for trends and ratios. From your experience and and what you've seen uh, from the people you work with and also just from the amount of people that you've affected with your content and the value that you put out, just the, the last little thing on the Alzheimer's side of things, outside of, let's say, sleep, exercise, maybe supplementation, which um, I'd love to touch on in a second. You mentioned things like things like negative thinking, um, the environments we're in, even people that we're surrounding ourselves with. How much of an importance does that play or how much of a role does that play on the development of Alzheimer's? And, and do you have any recommendations of things people can be doing, I guess, to to remove themselves from those type of situations? Because obviously we look at, uh, even I talk on the show about how important it is to, you know, surround yourself with with uh, people and environments that are going to allow you to grow and, and better yourself and obviously becoming very aware of the thoughts you're filling your head with daily and the language you're using to yourself and to others and and trying to stay at that high frequency as often as possible and getting out of the victim mentality and all that type of stuff but are there any recommendations from your side or things that you like to implement with the athletes or um, mm. you know people on Wall Street or whatever it may be that you work with? So there was um, a great Harvard study that tracked people over the span of 80 years. It was a really beautiful study. And what they showed was that long-term brain health outcomes, the people who measured at 80 years old to have, or maybe it was 100, to have the best brains and the best brain health were those who had good and supportive relationships. And it doesn't mm. mean romantic, just romantic relationships. Yeah. It is all relationships. So the people that you surround yourself with, you end up really through neuroplasticity, you end up becoming. And you know, if you hang out with five smokers, you will become the sixth smoker. But it's the mm -hmm. actual same with just people that you are surrounding yourself with and getting their opinions from. So if you are always with a negative person, you will in turn see things negative and negativity can actually increase the amount of stress that we have ergo increase the amount of cortisol our stress hormone that we have and we know that stress chronic stress is really impedes the brain health outcomes because there is something called inflammation and we have neural inflammation that is inflammation of the central nervous system and this is actually one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. We like having an inflamed brain is not very good for us. We've already mm. got so much happening with what we put in our bodies through the ultra processed foods, through the environment, through microplastics now. Like there's so much happening. We can mitigate this just by the people that we hang out with. And, you know, I've actually been trimming my 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 tree lately and realizing mm -hmm. that time is definitely short and you want to spend the most time that you can with the people that are going to progress you forward into the person that you want to be. Oftentimes we get lost, right? We're not, sometimes we get off track, which I think is fine. We get off track with what we want, who we want to become, uh, what goals we want. And that impedes our process from a physiological potential as well. Like we, I, I, I see everything from a physiological standpoint. I think yeah. to myself, if my brain doesn't know where I'm going, how am I going to release dopamine? Dopamine is that yeah. molecule that is responsible for motivation and drive. And we have a dopamine loop. So meaning if you are forward motion, if you have a goal, and you're telling your brain, great, today I got one step further towards my goal, you'll release more more dopamine. And it keeps going mm -hmm. and going and going. But if you don't have any goals, 
If you're just hanging around with like people who don't really have that many goals, you're not going to get that dopamine release. And you're going to end if without dopamine, without something in your brain telling you you're doing a good job, keep going, get up, you will lose meaning and purpose in life. Mm. And I got to tell you, I, I, it was last year, I was like taking a look, I was taking inventory and I was like, my, I'm hanging out with people who don't actually have goals. What? What's that about? Like, it, it's really, it's like really confronting. It's like, I can't, if you've got nothing that you're striving yeah. for, I can't do that because I've got things I'm striving for. Yeah. And I think it's, that's really important on that note that we do take responsibility for that. I think it's, uh, it, and that can be often, often difficult at times, right? As you said, it might be people that you spent time with for a long period of time. It could be a family member. It could be a friend that you've had since high school, whatever it may be. But in the end of the day, it is our responsibility to look at, okay, who am I surrounding myself with? What environments am I putting myself in? That doesn't mean you need to cut off people completely, but you, you do have to be selective with where and who you're giving your energy to because it does say, play such a big role as we've just, yeah. as we've just heard. I would love to, I am very, very mindful of your time. I know you're a very busy individual and, um, and I want to be respectful of your time, but I would love to touch on first the supplementation side of things um, if, if you have time, but also I would also love to hear from you around hydration because I think with hydration, mm -hmm. we often, mm -hmm. well, people often think, okay, I'm dehydrated. Let me just drink some more water, but probably neglect the electrolyte side of things as well. And so I, I know that's probably a topic that we could spend hours talking about, but um, if you have any recommendations for the audience, because I know they'd benefit immensely from it. Let's talk about um, the two supplements that I think that absolutely everybody without a doubt should be taking. Now, keep in mind, I'm extremely big on blood work. When you come on board as a client at Neuro Athletics, we literally do like the amount of blood work, we're taking 10 vials of blood. I don't think you can understand how, what your health status is without lifting the hood and taking a look at blood work. Mm. So outside of that, okay, let's just say no one's taking blood work. Well, then what supplements can you be taking? The only supplements that you should take outside of blood work is creatine. And this is in my humble opinion, creatine and omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA. Now, creatine first came on the market in terms of bodybuilding and athletic performance. We know that it mm. was founded by a scientist that first showed that when he was giving it to his athletes, they were winning gold medals at an Olymp at the Olympic Games. So we knew this to take creatine and it can help with athletic performance. We now have substantial evidence, peer-reviewed uh, randomized control trials to show that creatine can also be beneficial for the brain. So creatine, the actual molecule, yes, we produce it on our own. We don't, pro we produce it on our own. We don't produce enough of it, but creatine monohydrate mm. is involved in cell energy metabolism, cell energy metabolism. It helps with the creation of ATP, which is where we get our energy from. Energy is life. So give, give me more of that. I think that we should all yeah. be taking that. Right. And it turns out that in cases of let's take a let's take parkinson's disease let's take neurodegenerative diseases like all the dementias they have a lack of energy a lack of energy in your brain to do yeah. what's needed so that's where this you know the studies came about thinking well what would happen if i supplemented or if i gave five grams of creatine per day or 10 grams of creatine per day to a brain that was you know suffering from less energy what would happen and it's shown now that we've got great evidence to show that you can slow the progression of age-related loss in the brain through at, at minimum five grams of creatine per day we see that post-traumatic insults like concussions we can mm. see that creatine before going onto the field one study where they took a group of they were only 21 years old so so younger boys but those who yeah. were actually in the nfl they took them and they gave them 20 grams of creatine per day 20 grams of creatine per day and mm. what they showed was that it actually served as a protective mechanism against the brain wow. so when they went out and got hit their brain was actually protected the neurons were protected from creatine now 
so many women are scared of taking creatine, scared that they're going to get bulky, scared that they're, you know, men are scared that it's going to increase DHT, they're going to lose their hair. There has been no reported cases. If you look at these studies, there is no cases of kidney damage. There's no cases of any type of organ damage or even mm. hair loss. There was a study that was done on postmenopausal women and bone density. They tracked them for two years and they were giving them 10 grams of creatine per day for two years. They had no side effects. In fact, yeah. they got stronger. In your opinion, is there a minimum age that we should be giving people creatine? I, I have a lot of clients who their their kids are now either starting to develop as an athlete in sport or they're just getting into the gym and is there a minimum age that you would suggest going no lower than that age in terms of providing someone with with creatine monohydrate i would say 12 years old and that doesn't actually come from any data the data actually suggests that all ages are fine but i would say just even mm. precautionary um start starting you know 12 to 15 year olds off with about 2.5 grams per day obviously consult with your physician before you add anything in but it's it can you know i've got my dad supplementing on five grams a day as well i'm trying to get him up to uh, seven and a half brilliant and and he's yeah. seen good benefit from implementing it yeah well sometimes he thinks it's a placebo he thinks a lot of things are placebos but yeah even though that's pretty good though <laughs> And just in regards to the omega-3s, you mentioned the EPA and DHA. Um, I know mm -hmm. for a lot of people that will probably mean absolutely fuck all to them. Um, but mm -hmm. are you able to just explain what the difference is between that? Because we've got EPA, DHA and ALA. ALA? Yeah. Yes. So omega-3 um, fatty so why acids. why are they important? Well, so omega-3 fatty acids come from fatty fish, your salmon, your mackerel, and they're broken into three parts. You've got EPA, DHA, and ALA. So EPA and DHA are the ones that we're really uh, going to talk about. They're the ones that are studied the most. And the ALA is actually the omega-3s that come from flax seeds and chia seeds. Okay. But in order to actually get the content, that needs to be converted back into the EPA, DHA. So EPA and DHA, first and foremost, we have to understand that your brain is made, 60% of it is made of fat. The rest is water. Out of that 60%, around 20% of that is made from DHA, literally. So wow. you're literally eating, when you eat DHA, you are eating for your brain and for your brain mm. health. So DHA actually, EPA and DHA is so marvelous. It's got the safety profile of, um, of a nutrient. So it's extremely safe but it acts as like an FDA approved product, meaning that it should be a prescribed prescription grade product because that's how good it is. One thing that it does is it really lowers the inflammatory biomarkers in your body. So you think when you are really mm. inflamed or when you are uh, stressed, you can lower the amount of inflammation by taking omega-3 fatty acids, which is why I take them in the afternoon because I take them okay. away from exercise because we need inflammation for exercise to take place. Yeah. I usually take EPA DHA at night. I'm taking four grams a day, two grams of EPA and two grams of DHA. What else do we see? We've seen fantastic studies of EPA and DHA ameliorating some of the plaques that are built up from amyloid beta. We're seeing EPA and DHA helping with cell membrane fluidity. And we've also seen, and this was out of um, Dr. Bill Harris's group. He formulated, mm -hmm. he's also on the World Alzheimer's Day with me. Dr. Bill Harris formulated a test and it was called the omega-3 index, which is a measurement of the amount of omega-3 in a red blood cell. And what he found was that those with an increased five-year increase of all-cause mortality have an omega-3 index of 4% or less. So I just did my omega-3 index test. I'm 10.5%. So if you have anything from 8% or above, you mm. increase your life expectancy by over five years. So omega-3s wow. are so, yeah, they're so potent. They're so crucial. Caveat, you want to be getting your omega-3s 
from a very quality brand because a lot of them out there can be really rancid. I don't know in Australia, I use um, Momentus here in America, a really clean brand um, in Australia for me, which is what I get my parents on, is the, is it Bioceuticals? Bioceuticals, yeah, I was just about to say, the they, they're, yeah. they're good? Yeah, they're great. Fantastic. And so the recommendation was two grams of each, or is that just personal right. to you? Uh, that's for that's, everyone. No, that's for everyone. And I honestly, you can, you should go and get omega-3 index test yeah. and test where you're at. I 100% will. Um, as I said, want to be respectful of your time. Do you have enough time to quickly touch on um, on the importance of the electrolytes when it comes to staying hydrated? Yeah. So yeah, hydration, brilliant. your your body is your muscles are like 90%, like your, your muscles need water and need to be hydrated in order for you to be able to push as much as you need to push to get an adaptation at the gym. And our brain literally, when we, I keep saying the word literally, because it, it's a, it, your brain, your brain cells, the only way that they function is they communicate with each other. When they communicate mm -hmm. with each other, cell to cell, they produce a synapse and this synapse li literally <laughs> is needed like the, the the needs electrolytes in order for, for, for them to synapse you've got this some you've got something called the sodium potassium pump mm -hmm. so your brain needs electrolytes in order to function it doesn't just need hydration it needs electrolytes and when you are even just a two percent dehydrated i'm talking electrolytes and of course water yeah you're 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 missing around 30 percent of your cognitive functions they go down just due to 2% loss of um, electrolytes. So you also have to remember that we sweat on a daily basis, even in the winter, just because it's not visible. You're sweating all day, every day mm. in little amounts. And sweat isn't just water. It is electrolytes. It is yeah. selenium, potassium, zinc. And so we, sodium, we need all of these. So for me, I have a sachet of element every single day. Mm-hmm. When it gets warmer, maybe I'll have two. Uh, I'm always up to date with my hydration as well. Like I'm drinking around two and a half liters a day. Yeah, I, I think people uh, well, these days are often scared of sodium or scared of salt. Um, and, and with that hydration, rehydration side of things, it's it, the, the emphasis just goes on the water side of things. But thanks for thanks for sharing that. I think it's, it is really important in terms of the electrolytes. You mentioned element. Is that, that's the one you use over in the States? Yeah. L M N T. I mean, look, it's got a very high safety profile, just like creatine, by the way. Um, creatine is the most widely studied supplement on the market. So yeah. it's extremely safe to take just like, um, electrolytes. I think maybe, I don't know what they have in Australia, but I know you guys can get electrolytes anywhere. Just stay away from, um, stay away from Gatorade. Stay away from Gatorade. Yeah. Will do. <laughs> uh, well, Louisa, thank you so much for your time. I, I honestly, I say, I end up saying this to almost every guest because I genuinely just don't speak to guests unless I really enjoy speaking to them. But I could sit here and just talk to you all day. There's so many things I'd love to ask you, and and so hopefully we can link up again in the in the near future and do another episode. I know you're coming out to Australia. Um, yes. I don't know what, what date is it. What month is that? So um, for the Clean Health Live conference yeah. which will take place 26th of april brilliant brilliant um and i also wanted to talk quickly about or not talk just mention quickly around um the new athletics course or certification yeah. that, that coaches or um or uh yeah coaches can do do you want to share a bit mm. of information about that and we'll obviously have the links to that in the show notes along with all of louise's uh social profiles and stuff so you guys can keep up to date with all her um incredible content and continue to learn from her but are you able to give us some information about about neuroathletics and and how people can i guess get in touch or or continue to further their education with you guys yeah, so we've um, certified over 2,000 people now, coaches, health coaches, uh, athletic trainers, it doesn't matter what you are, and we certify people based on the six core pillars of human performance. So if anybody wants to understand the core pillars of human performance, be able to shrink the mortality curve in this world and be able to develop a human performance package, so they can be working with higher net worth individuals. They can be taking themselves out of the daily grind of, you know, trading time for money and build out packages mm. 
then definitely um, come and see us. It's a 100% online course. We do this live. So it's a, it's like a consulting course, if you will. I, I do it in a classroom style environment, all online. It takes place uh, every six weeks. So we have different cohorts and it's brilliant. It's like my work of art. It's the best thing that I, I, I ever do. I, I love it so much. Incredible. Well, it's definitely something that I'll be doing in the very near future. I think I saw you may have one beginning next week or the week after. Yes, um, so 25th. Not, uh, maybe, maybe the following one, but um, I'll definitely be doing it because I've, yeah, I've learned so much even from today, but just from following along with your content since we first connected back in 2018. And as I mentioned to you before we hit record today, um, I'm super stoked to see how much growth you've had um, professionally, but also personally and and yeah, I just wanted to express my gratitude for all the, the value that you put out and the amount of people that you're helping. And I'm looking forward to staying connected. And, and we hope everyone who's tuned into this episode today, which I'm sure you will have, has taken some value and, and something that you can implement into your own life and, and just a further understanding of the importance of our lifestyle choices as well, which I think is extremely important, along with the importance of obviously exercise for longevity and, and how you can implement that into your own routine. So Louisa, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. Thanks, Danny. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure.